It is a great privilege and a great honor to, to be before you this morning. Just knowing Jeff Gleason and calling and, and saying that he might need me to be here and just to be able to be a part of Kingdom Purpose here in Augusta is a delight. And so I have been preaching through the book of, the book of Amos. And so that is where we are going to turn our eyes this morning. And, and what I have found about these minor prophets is how challenging the words are to us. How encouraging it can be as well, but also how it points to the amazing grace of our God. And as I have looked at this text, here's what you will see throughout the Old Testament is how practical it is for mine and for your lives, as well as how it points to our God who's really the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I know that for most of you, you didn't open up or think in your morning reading, I think I'll go to Amos. And so it's a book that sometimes we talk about its flyover territory. We just kind of go right past it as we're reading. So what I want to do is give you just a little bit of background on where Amos is when we come to chapter 7 this morning. So we think about the, the kingdom of Israel. It is united. In 931, there's going to be this divide. And when this divide comes, you see, from, that happens in 1 Kings chapter 12, and so we're tracing the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom continues until 2 Kings 17, where there's the exile. And so we ask this, what has God been doing for that almost 200 years in the northern kingdom? Well, he sends Elijah, and he sends Elisha, and he's calling the people to turn back. And then we come to the days of Jeroboam II. Think 793 to 753. The last long remaining king before these 30 years of six different kings. And what God does is he sends almost like what we might say is a one-two punch. With Hosea and with Amos. Calling the people to turn back. Now, we might say of the days of Jeroboam like Charles Dickens did of the 18th century. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the best of times because national security was in place. Economic prosperity was booming. But it was the worst of times because the people's hearts were far from God. And so God calls this shepherd and caretaker of figs, to go to the northern kingdom and to preach the gospel. And so he goes and he's in the synagogue and he's preaching and he starts by talking about the other nation's sins. And you can almost see the Israelites, they're sitting in their chairs and it might be like somebody pointing out the sins of another person. You feel really good because they're not pointing at you. And then Amos says, here's the problem. Is that you have God's word and you're living just like the world. And then, like a father might do to a son, he tells the people, I want you to know of God's affection for you. In chapter 3, he tells them of, of all the nations, God has known you, he's had an affection for you. It might be like I see you with families and your little ones, that you, you put your hands around those sweet little faces and you say, do you remember who I am? I'm mom, I'm dad, we love you. But the people's affection was lost for God. He was no longer their authority anymore. When they came to worship, it was about making much of themselves as they proclaimed their sacrifices and little thought of God. And they had removed the sin offerings, indicating that they were not a sinful people in need of a redeemer. And then just as you walk around and you talk within the church, Amos was around as well, and he kept hearing them say things like, I sure am ready for the day of the Lord. Now, Amos is perplexed. Like, why are they saying this? What Amos explains to them is that what you believe about the day of the Lord is that it will be ultimately deliverance for Israel and defeat of all the nations. That's not what's going to happen. The day of the Lord is about the day when the anointed one, when the Messiah will come a second time, and he will certainly deliver, but he will deliver God's people. And all those outside of him will be separated eternally from God. 
He says to the people, listen, you know where you're resting your hope? You're resting in Zion, which is Jerusalem. You're resting in your religious works. And you're resting on Mount of Samaria as well, which is the military strength. And Amos says, those on the day of the Lord will be of no help to you. And so now what God is going to do is He's going to give these three visions to Amos. Locusts, fire, and this plumb line. And where you and I are going to look this morning, we'll look at those, we'll look at those visions, but we're going to see who might be the most unlikely person who's really going to mediate for those Israelites. And then we're going to see who our God is, His grace and His mercy. And then we're going to look at the plumb line. And the plumb line evaluates who is crooked and who is straight. And the only one who we can rest in for a plumb line that's straight. So let's jump into our text. It's going to be, yeah, sometimes you think Old Testament is way back in the Israelites. This is really practical for us today. So we're going to look at Amos 7 verses 1 through 6 initially. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. And behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. When they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, Oh, Lord God, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God was calling for a judgment by fire, and it devoured the great deep and was eating up the land. Then I said, O oh Lord, please cease. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. So we have these first two visions. Visions of, of locusts and of fire, both indicating a, a catastrophic event that's going to happen for Israel. Now the locusts would have been devastating in this way. We're thinking about a first crop and a second crop. And so Israel would plant a crop, it would begin to grow, and then there would be a second crop. Now when these locusts are going to come, it is at a time where both of those crops are in the ground. And as the locusts come... It will devastate not only the grain, but it will devastate the, veg the uh, vegetables as well. There will be nothing left with these locusts. And while this would be bad, we see this second vision as well, which would be even worse. It is a fire. Now, we don't know exactly what that fire would be. But what we do understand is that it would likely be something of some kind of, you think Africa, Sahara Desert. You think about a heat that would come that would dry up the depths of the waters. It would take away the crops. It would have significant impact, not only on the livestock, but the people. And so we see an escalating of judgment that is going to take place. Now, when some read this text, Especially if you're talking to a friend in the community, they'll say things like, I just can't believe that a God, a God of the Bible, would bring such kind of events. And others might come to you and say, you know what, I sure am glad that I serve the New Testament God. A God who's a God of, of love and of grace, and I don't, have to, I don't have to worship the God of the Old Testament who's a God of, of wrath and judgment. And what I want you to see is that that is a wrong theology. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I want you to think about it in this way. As I, as I see the children here, I want you to imagine your son or daughter who is headed for some great difficulty, hardship. There was a cliff in front of them. And they're headed in that direction to be indifferent and say nothing would not be loving at all. You would never watch your child head for that cliff and say nothing. Why? Because you love them deeply. So what would you do? You would probably stop them at first, like I might with one of mine, and say, Tristan, listen, son, you don't want to head in that direction. 
And then if he doesn't listen and he's continuing to head in that direction, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to walk after him and put my hand on his shoulder and I'm going to turn him around and say, son, that is not your greatest good. And if he continues in that path, I will grab his shoulders to pull him back. And so what we see is this, is this is what God is doing. He has sent the prophets to speak to the people to tell them to turn back. For the direction of which they are going is not their greatest good. But as they do not listen, he will begin to ratchet up, just as I would with my son, ratchet up the discipline, the judgment, that they may see with gospel eyes and not clogged blind eyes. It's a little bit like Hosea 5, 12, and 14. God is compared to a moth at first. You know what happens when you're, you're reading a book and it's, you got the light on up and the moth is just kind of up, up in the light, just kind of flickering? What does it do? It just kind of distracts you. That's what God will do. Distract you away from your sin to see what is right. But what happens when a moth gets maybe in your closet? They can begin to eat on the cloth and be destructive. So what is God going to do? He's going to ratchet up at times. Why? Because he loves you. And in Hosea 5.14, you know what he says if you don't listen to that? It will be like the lion. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to see who your God is. That your God will not sit idly while we are walking in sin, but that He will come to His people, even if it is great difficulty and hardship, to direct us back to the place we need to be. And sadly, it takes at times famines, plagues, wars, difficulties, and hardships to pry the sin out of our hardened hearts. You see, what God will do is He will shatter the illusion that you and I are self-sufficient. And when He does, it can hurt. Our hearts often, so often, will look and hope in every aspect of the world. We'll rest our hope on the things in the world, and God will take those things from us that we may see that our hope is found in Christ alone. These are the warnings and the judgments that God brings. And sometimes he will even bring us to the brink of death to weed out the sins in our hearts that you and I struggle with so often. That blinds our eyes and clogs our ears. So when you see some of these judgments... See them not simply as a wrathful God. See them as a loving parent who is calling out to a child to come back. That is our God. Because you know what happens at times? We find our little sins and we compartmentalize them. And we try to separate the world from them. And here's what we do is we protect those sins at all costs. And God says, that thing you're hoping in, I will take it. I will expose it. And it might hurt, but I love you that much. Now, as God reveals these visions to Amos, who do you think, if you were in the congregation, you were in the synagogue, and if you and I were there and we asked the question, who do you think would be the last person who would intercede and intervene for Israel. I bet a bunch of them would raise their hand and say that, Amos. I bet he would not be the one because he's the one that's that's speaking these what seem to be harsher words to us. He's speaking of these judgments. And you know what we've done to him? We've reached out to Jeroboam to tell Jeroboam of how this man is speaking these words against him, we've tried to bring harm to Amos. We've actually told Amos to close his mouth and quit speaking. And we've told that southern prophet to pack his bags and head back south because we don't want to hear it. He might likely be the one that we all think would be the last person to intercede. But look at the text. 
Look at verse 2. It is Amos pleading for the Israelites. In verse 2, Amos pleads, O Lord God, please forgive them. And then again in verse 5, O Lord, please cease. You see, Israel, the one you think hates you because he's spoken hard words is really the one who truly loves you. John Calvin says this of Amos. He says, For though you think of me to be adverse to you, as I am constrained daily to threaten you, I yet feel compassion for you and wish you to be saved. For the Lord had first resolved to destroy you, but yet He waits for you and therefore suspends His extreme vengeance, that by His kindness He may allure you to Himself. And this has been done through my prayers. Do you see what Amos is doing? He is pleading with God, O Israel, on your behalf. Amos's words then are not meant to destroy or despise you. But it's an appeal to the heart of Israel that they would see where their greatest good is. O Israel, Israel, you've seen Amos all wrong. He doesn't hate you. He doesn't desire destruction. You see, Amos is putting himself at risk, undergoing persecution, resentment. And while you spew those false words against Amos, he pleads for you. Amos is in the gap. Why doesn't he point to Jesus, who is the one person who is in the gap between the holy God and you and I who are sinful. Even as we struggle, even as we at times turn away from the Lord Jesus Christ, He's there sitting at the right hand of God the Father interceding for you and I. I want to get real practical with you this morning. There may have been, there may be now, there may be in the future, a brother or a sister who's come to you that has what seems to be a little harder words to you because of your actions, because of the way that you might be living. And what is our tendency when somebody says words to us about the way that we're living our lives? We'll say things like, you, you just don't understand me. You don't understand what I'm going through. That was critical You obviously don't care about me speaking to me in such a way. But if you have someone who is speaking truth and grace, I want you to be very careful how you perceive this person. Because it might not be at all that he doesn't love you or care for you, but that what he just had to say to you was probably the most difficult thing that he or she has had to say. And and that person didn't desire to say that to you in any way, but they love you that much. And they see that your greatest good is not in the course of action that you're taking. And they delight in you and want you to turn back. You who are in this congregation, you love one another, you care for one another. If you hear a word from someone about your own life, it's not that they hate you. They love you. And they want your greatest good. As leaders as well, I want you to see that silence is not an act of love. In fact, it can be very unloving. There are leaders of this church that are here. If you see those things, be courageous. Speak in grace and truth. You are leaders in your own household, moms and dads. Do not be indifferent and be silent. Speak those truths. And you little ones who are sitting in these pews, you will go to school. You will be around and see other people. Be those leaders that know your God and you speak grace and truth. Why? Because you love those who are around you. I want you to see another very important point here. 
is that you and I all know that we have those people that we are to be praying for. Maybe in your congregation or in your family, your co-workers. And you know how often it is, it's, it's hard at times to pray for all those that you know you need to be praying for. But how hard is it to pray for someone who you think have hurt you? or maybe even done you harm, or have sinned against you. The Israelites sinned against Amos. He's praying for them. Now when we do pray, what do we usually pray for? When there's that occasion where your spouse has hurt you, or a co-worker's hurt you, what do we tend to pray for? We tend to pray for justice. What does Amos pray for? Grace and compassion. That the Israelites would see their heart and turn back unto God. May that be our heart. Our tendency is to say, Lord, I want them to have justice. May we be a people who say, God, I want you to have compassion and grace on their heart that they may see who you are, turn from their ways, and unto you, God. May that be our prayer. As we continue to look at Amos' prayer and God's response, Amos' prayer was not based, listen to this, it was not based upon Israel's repentance. It wasn't based upon Israel's righteousness. There was zero question that Israel deserved exactly what the Lord identified would come. Amos pleads on the character of God. On God's grace and God's mercy and that alone. And what does God do with regard to the locust and regard to the fire? He relents. He relents. The Hebrew word there that he speaks of for relenting is the same Hebrew word, Naham, that is found in Judges 2.18. For the Lord was moved to Naham, to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. Do you see what is happening? God was moved to compassion and pity for the Israelites and to delay bringing such judgment to give the people more time to repent. You see who your God is. He has compassion. Somebody tells you that the Old Testament God is a different God from the God today. It is wrong. Our God is a compassionate God. He is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And so maybe the philosophical question is this. Will grace ultimately override justice? Or will justice drive out grace? I want you to hear that question again. Will grace ultimately override justice or will justice drive out grace you know what the answer is neither both find their full expression on the cross with christ and calvary you see god loves his people so much that he will have you with him in eternity that he would not relent of the judgment of the locusts and the judgment of the fire and all the judgments, but that he would lay them on the head and the back of Jesus Christ. All that wrath and judgment on him, that you and I would have grace and mercy. Jesus Christ would take all of that wrath From the moment he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To those three hours later that he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. That Jesus Christ could take the full realm of that wrath in three hours. Tells you about the man who hung on the cross. The dignity, the honor in God himself. That's how much he loves you. That's how much. Old Testament Christians, New Testament Christians. And at the greatest depths of your souls, I need you to know this, 
that the idols and those sins that you love, they will never free you. They will enslave you. And when it comes time to be there for you on that day of your death, at the day of the Lord, they will sacrifice nothing for you. But God will lay down His Son. He will put His Son in front of the freight train of His wrath because He loves you that much. And so I want you to know that. I want you to delight in that. I want you to, I want you to see that. And so He's saying to Israel, stop going through the motions. See that there is a feast that God has laid out for you and His name is in Christ. Stop feeding on the crumbs. Feed on the feast of Christ. Let Him be the thing that you have an affection for. May He be the thing that guides your every thought. And so when it comes to your marriages and it comes to your relationships, take your eyes off yourself. Take your eyes off your own pains and your your own hurts and what that person deserves and doesn't deserve. And I want you to think vertically on the compassion and the grace that God has given you And you meditate on that. And when your spouse has hurt you, when your children have hurt you, when a co-worker's hurt you, you think about the abundant grace that God has given you. You think about that and you extend that vertically to that other person. You think about what marriages and our relationships would look like if our eyes were not on ourselves and the hurt that someone has hurt me and my eyes are simply on my heavenly Father with the overflow of His affection on me to another. And I think as long as He continues to give me compassion, I'll do the same. And I'll stop giving compassion when He stops giving compassion to me. He will not stop. We come to Amos 7, verses 7 through 9. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people of Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. In this third vision, God asked Amos, Amos, what do you see? Amos says, I see a plumb line. Now, I want you to understand what a plumb line is. A plumb line is a string. And on the bottom of the string would be a pebble, a rock, or some kind of weight. And what a builder would do is as they built the wall in those days, they would take that plumb line. And as, it, and as gravity pulled it straight down, they'd be able to look at the wall to see, is it vertical? Is it straight? Now here, the Lord is the builder, and He's going to check Israel to see if the nation is as upright as they claim to be. And like a wall that was once straight as God brought them in to the kingdom under David, now they are crooked in disrepair. And so what God says is just like a wall that is now crooked and bent, they are to be taken down, so Israel will be taken down as well. Why? Verse 9 talks about the corruption of the national religion, these high places and these sanctuaries. They went to the synagogues. They went to the sacrifices. But do you know why they went? Because they thought the works would save them. They thought because their daddy was Abraham. And that mom and dad had believed maybe in the past. And that if I did these works, it would save me. And God says, that's not how it works. And then he says, there's something else going on. It's Jeroboam. He is to be a king who is a type of the anti-type, which is God himself. He's to be a king pointing to him. And he's leading the people away from me. So I want you to think about yourself as well as, as leaders And again, leaders in your own home. Where are you leading your children? Where are you leading those who are beside you? Are you leading them to yourself? Are you leading them to themselves? Are you leading them unto God? 
You see, we have to ask ourselves, are we taking those who are following us to the Savior, or are we taking them astray? Paul says this in Philippians 4, 9, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace with you. The God of peace will be with you. He's saying, listen, Paul's saying, live in a sense how I'm telling you because I'm pointing you to Christ. Now, as he tells Israel to take the plumb line and measure themselves, we have to ask ourselves, how is the plumb line as it measures you and I? You see, we live in a society today that says, you're okay and I'm okay. Moralities vacillate all over the place, and really, at the end of the day, we'll say a lot of times that I'm pretty good, because why? Because we compare ourselves to someone else. And we're always going to think a lot highly of ourselves than we are of others. And so we say we are good until God sends the true plumb line, the true standard of measure, Christ. I want you to see how this works. Just an illustration that James Montgomery Boyce said. And children, y'all listen to this. This will be, y'all will, this is about children, right? So think about this. There's There's a teacher, and the teacher comes in and says, class, what I want you to do is I want you to draw a straight line. And she gives that instruction, and about the time the principal calls her over and says, hey, I need to have a, I just talk to you for a little bit. Now, what do the kids do? They all say, well, we're just going to go ahead and start drawing the lines. And so you've got, uh, you've got little Billy, and he starts drawing his line, and Billy's drawing his line, and then Johnny's drawing his line, and Johnny looks at Billy's, and Johnny says, well, mine's straighter than yours. And they all kind of look, and they say, yeah, actually, it is straighter than yours, Billy. And then Mary begins to draw a line, and they all look at that line as well, and everybody agrees that Mary's is sh- straighter than Billy's and Johnny. And the teacher walks in, and the class says, guess what we've done? We've all drawn our lines just like you told us. And she said, no. What I wanted you to do was draw a line with a ruler. And as they did, guess what? Not one line was straight. You see, before God steps in, we all think that our lives are straight. And Jesus comes in, and there is no line straight in comparison to Jesus. And so that's the trouble with appealing to God's justice. Many think that they want from God is justice. They'll say, God, we want justice. And they'll say, God, it isn't right for you to judge us with locust or fire because some of us are better than others. And we demand you take those differences into account. And so God says, all right, we'll really see who measures up to be God, or who measures up to be straight. And Jesus Christ lives the perfect life. And you and I are not called to be pretty good. We're called to be perfect. And so an appeal to justice will save no one. All will be condemned by God's justice. But if you and I will forget our pride, abandon our arrogance, And instead, not ask for justice, but ask that we live for the mercy of God. We will be saved. As I close this morning, you and I, everyone will have a plumb line laid in front of us. Every one of us. But for those who are in Christ, Christ steps in front of us says to the Father, measure the plumb line according to me. And we will be straight in Christ. Not because you did anything good or bad, but because of the mercy of our God. And because he has been so compassionate to you, be a people who extend that same compassion. Pray for those who are hard to pray for. That this church at Cliffwood, that you and your life, you and your families would be a people who delight in our Lord. Let's pray.